I was born on the edge of the desert. There is a whole crowd of winds here on this Persian land that are live beings, wandering or settled, wicked or debonair, cheerful or earnest. There are pet winds and there are savage winds. Men know them well and call them by their names. My name is Bade Sabah. an oasis wind. I used to frolic in the places where my father and mother had lived. I cooled myself ruffling palm trees and when dates grew ripe I made them drop. wind catchers called bad gear. When I met with one, I would rush into it, cool the house and come out fraught with family secrets. I deeply felt their sorrows and their loyalty. repeating, you poor little local wind, you breathless breeze, you draft. I was well aware that I had no taste for fighting and I was ashamed of it. Had Badadiv not existed, I would have been happy, but it was not the case. One day, winds passed by driving clouds. They told me about their travels and adventures and offered to let me join them. I felt like finding out what was beyond the mountain. I was ready to go to the ends of the earth to live down the image that Bader Div had imposed on me. They entrusted me with clouds to push and I drove them forward. But one must know the tricks of the trade. They flee in all directions. They spread out, get torn and fade away. Finally, I made such a bungle of it that my clouds got stuck against the mountain and poured their water on useless ground of the desert. Thinking all about this last water, I felt so sorry for the faraway gardens that had prepared themselves to receive it. Of course I wondered if I really was a hopeless fool, as Bade Div would always say.
I was left alone, turning over and over in my mind the question, was I a fool? At this point, I heard Bada Deev coming. Once again, he mocked me and my sadness. You idiot, he said. What are you doing here all by yourself? We've been looking for you everywhere. Pull yourself together and come with us, desert winds. We're tough guys, not little boys. We live as we like, and we do as we please. Look, this country is ours. We have driven the men out of it, and now it really belongs to us. We have a great time shaping dunes and moving them around, and we enjoy smothering cities. Places reduced to silence are only hosts and playmates, are reptiles and wild beasts. See this tower? An old wind told me it was the Tower of Babel. Men had built it as a stepladder for the gods. Thus they hoped to prompt them to come down on the earth. They do have strange ideas. Well, we, the desert winds, have been stronger than their ideas. And that without effort. They had their petty differences and they quarreled until they lost their common tongue. We blew confusion into their minds. First the architect started flinging drafts at one another's head. Then the masons pitched into one another, and the rest followed the lead. In the end, everyone went his own way, their thoughts bent on revenge. Nomads came and settled here. We'd rather like them. Like us, they believe that the earth belongs to no one. They have never accepted the existence of towns. Like us, they are wanderers, and we accompany them.
hill called Sousa is made out of cities we had buried. Recently some people took a fancy to this. To find these cities, they had to dig very deep, so thoroughly had we done the job. The first city stood here thousands and thousands of years ago. Here, generation after generation, people have toiled and rejoiced. We have buried everything. And the nomads have come, roaming about the remains. But the city rose again, and broke in. And we buried everything. Thus, spread over uneven periods of time, 15 cities have grown and died here. Each had her great scholars, her great politicians, her great warriors, her great artists. Each claimed to be not only the most beautiful city on earth, but also the mightiest and the wisest. Fifteen times we have overlaid them with dust and sand, and each time the nomads would come back. kings had a vast palace, all in cedar wood, gold and marble. Every wall told of their victories. A large city lay around the palace. 
Most of the gold at the time had converged to Persepolis and was used from here to crush the most remote opposition. Yet the sovereigns lived here in quest of purity. But gold had lured them into believing that it could take care of everything. This illusion opened the way to the victorious Greeks. Purity they were not too much concerned with, but they were great sportsmen. Thus, one night, we happened to see Alexander the Great of Macedonia get up from his dinner table and set fire to all these splendors. He was rather a nice man as far as conquerors go, but he was fond of drinking. The story goes that he burned Persepolis to please some Greek cities. But this is a story for historians. As a matter of fact, we are responsible for it all. To begin with, the fire was a late night whim. But we blew so hard that the flames died out only when nothing was left to be burned. Such was their roaring that it drowned the shrieks of the dark crowd swirling in the jammed streets and alleys. Molten gold dripped from the blazing cornices. Alexander's jolly mates were in tears with laughter. Conquests disrupt the daily routine and the ladies. They had no other purpose. But we did the main part of the job. We blew very, very hard indeed. This is what Father Dev told me. But I, Father Sabah, prefer men to ruins and shyly said so to Father Dev and the desert winds. They called me a simpleton and went their way. I can't help being attracted to lively villages. I enjoy loving people and helping them. For a while I thought I had found the village that suited me. I grew fond of these people. As it happened, they had a whim who wished to stare as little as possible. I went to see him. He was indeed charming, refined and a great talker. I made out as if I was an old hand on the road and a great character. I was tempted to stir things up a bit. All was stagnant here. People had to push their own boats. and to alter these is a tricky job. Above all, you must not blow, or at least not more than what is strictly necessary. The buffaloes would choke on their food, and you might raise insoluble problems. My friend and I were doing nothing but talk. All his life he had longed to travel. He had never seen Isfahan and proposed that we go there together. My heart forgets as easily as it is moved. In spite of all my good feelings, off we went, leaving the villagers without any wind at all. We went far from Isfahan when a young man, who undoubtedly had a girl in mind, entrusted me with this message. O oh, musk-perfumed wind, like the waves of the river Zayanderud, carry my homage to the land of Isfahan, where works of art and gardens intertwine, 
where the cool breeze of paradise sheds blissful melodies. This message was no lyrical overstatement. I wondered that so large a city had managed to retain the charm of an oasis. The God and beauty of this city that even its tragic mementos failed to blare the air and the light. Here, the dismal Mongolians and the Afghans were unable to overcome with their bloodsheds the delights of the gardens. The air is supremely light in the city of Shah Abbas. It sings, and when it stops singing, one doesn't realize it, because colors take over. They sing too. Isfahan offers unto God a most spiritual sensuality. People here have been invaded so many times, yet they have never allowed themselves to be diverted from what appeals to them most, wit, poetry, and the joy of living. The invaders have been obliged to follow suit. This has continued for nearly 4,000 years. Overwhelmed by a mystical enthusiasm, Mashhad, the beloved capital of Nadir Shah, vanquisher of the great Mughal. Reza's tomb. Into the souls of the pilgrims, he breathes loyalty to the dead. We then pursued our pilgrimage towards the domes of Om. We made it a point to offer our prayers to Masume, Imam Reza's sister. I finally lost my friend among the pilgrims. But on the other hand, as I soared up, trying to catch sight of him, I met another wind, whirling and nearing like an infidel. It was Badesor, the heathen wind. You slavishly admire these monuments, he said. But winds too, my poor friend, can build. And he took palaces and cities of his own making. Cities for winds, exclusively. Man was wonderfully absent from this country. we saw things that human eye do not often see. A scene from the private life of the wild beasts. Finally, Badesor 
showed me his favorite retreat, his abode. A mineral island surrounded by a seething sea. Here, not a tuft of grass, not a living creature stands a chance to survive. Here, Bade Soch is the master. He has entrusted the custody of the place to the terrifying Bade Samur, the wind of sudden death, who would not only kill any creature on the spot, but also make it rot immediately. Yes, that luminous wasteland was redolent of death. Bade Soch explained that all these colors were the doings of fire. Indeed, the presence of fire has always been strongly felt all over this land. Long ago, the Persians had chosen it as God. Their true descendants have carried on. They long to burn bright and pure. They also worship earth and water. That is why they entrust their dead to these towers of silence, so that earth, water and fire may remain pure, as they themselves strive to be. I felt a strong urge to pass from the austere kingdom of fire to that of water. I left but These weird and dazzling abstractions, it was the sea approaching at last with its deeps and its mazes. Persian Gulf turned pink and gold, Bada Shorte, who mows waves and fills sails, welcomed me and showed me how to push boats. You see, he said, it's easy. You blow freely. The boats know what you do. But you mustn't be afraid of blowing if you want them to make headway. I went near the boats, repeating within myself, what he had said. As usual, I was afraid not to have enough breath. In spite of my clumsiness, Bade Shorte insisted on my staying with him. He was very proud of his work on the sea. All seafaring rests with me, he would say. All these sails that follow the sea depend on me. But where were all these sails? I hardly saw any. I felt he had had his time and pitied him. Well, I left him too. I'm a 
Further away, I caught sight of silhouettes, suggesting a sort of new Persepolis. These heavy, sailless vessels withheld, no doubt, a secret. Their power and the role they played, I could not make out. Bade Sarsar, the swift and bracing wind of the valleys, cleared up matters for me. These pipes, he said, bring fire to ships and then to the rest of the world. I'll show you where they come from. It's beyond all belief. Come with me. It's a long way off. to tame the fire they had worshipped. But when you make use of gods, there are always drawbacks. Bodhisattva's comment left me uneasy. It seemed like a frightening riddle, the answer to which meant life or death for the earth.
an impulse surging from the depth of my being to a world of blissful waters, free animals in moist air, sudden boundless spaces, glorious flowers, fleshy and fragile, and of men who would have never been reached by the restlessness of fire. This dream took me to the north.
I then reached the roof of the empire. It's an 18,000 feet high jewel. To the mountain winds, this is a roost, a drawing room, a funfair, a spring festival, a resting place, a summer resort. Here they rejoice before taking their flight to Tehran. It had never occurred to me that I would one day behold so extensive a city. I had often noticed that gliding over inhabited places, we winds realize the importance of what has been and is being undertaken there. Where does this divination come from? I do not know, but I'm very familiar with it. Here I felt something very old becoming new. took the trouble to show me the way to the tomb of the famous Reza Shah. He was a horseman ten feet tall. His wrath was mighty. He had the metal of a Darius the Great and the Shah Abbas. Seldom the will of one man has secured as Reza Shah did the unity and the survival of a people. sight of one of the emperor's palaces and slipped in through a window.
and that coming from the wind, highest admiration. I didn't quite know the age we were in. No beautiful muslin veiled Circassians, no scimitar bearing eunuchs, no flowing ambassadors, nothing. The palace was impressively empty. But the masters of the place, one could tell from their gentle and meditative faces. attracted and oppressed by the flow of so many destinies huddled together. In the night, I bumped into a wind who apologized courteously and introduced himself. It was the bazaar wind. He was kindly and seemed both mischievous and tired. He looked rather ill. We exchanged a few philosophical remarks and I told him about the uneasy pleasure I felt being among so many people. Until then, in the places I had haunted, men were scattered. It made them extremely interesting. I understand you well, he answered. I, too, catch myself fostering rustic longings. I was brought up in a village, and for a long time I contemplated going back. But one day you realize that you are intoxicated by the city. She makes you happy and unhappy at the same time. And the truth is, you cannot leave her anymore. You see, I weary my friends all day long with my plans for going back to the sources. But between you and I, I shall never leave this one. I know it too well. However, let me give you this piece of advice. Go to the north and pay a visit to my native province. It lies beyond the Alvors, along the steep. To cross the mountain, the easiest way is to follow the train. I took leave of my obliging friend. The next day I spotted the train and did my best to follow it. train would disappear into the mountain and it wasn't always easy to find it again. Once I lost trace of it altogether. I couldn't bring myself to enter these caverns. I wasn't too sure of what might happen to me in there. Finally, I made up my mind and went in. I found it quite a treat. The travelers applauded my nerve. How cool these black holes were. I understood why they had been dug. Undoubtedly, in order to cool the travelers. The 
bizarre wind had not misled me. I'd been around quite a lot, yet I didn't expect such a sight. This province was my dream. Nothing less than my dream. It made me feel the world had been molded by sensitive hands, not by elements. The shape of the hills, the setting of the trees, the still waters and the running stream, everything indeed seemed arranged according to the harmony man's heart yearns for. Here, the landscape had been composed by man's tender care and was quite different from those I had flown over until then. I had wondered for some time whether these mirrors that recall those of the Imperial Palace were not attempting endlessly to repeat the sky for the pleasure of it, or whether they were pieces in a giant game meant to imitate, through love of sheer beauty, the veins of rain-soaked leaves reflecting the sky.
last they reached this gentle sea for the love of which the earth shed its blood. Caspian shores would be a variation on it, a paradise of tigers and caviar. A few steps away in Ramsar, Throughout summer, the fashionable Iranians have a good time. Travelling toward Central Asia, I forgot fire altogether as I rolled with the flocks over the plains. Had I been reasonable, I would have settled down in this blessed land. I would have been forever free from the memory of Badadiv, my brother, and his insulting ways. But you know what curiosity is? It has its own reason to divert us from what appears to be reasonable. Yet, as it happens, it was just after such a detour that I was to find my private paradise. making incursions up to the very heart of the empire, banishing whatever they chose to in their ravens and their steps. So many landscapes had swept by that at a certain point I was unable to remember where I had seen them. Great travelers are well acquainted with this wearing away of memory. <laughs> But one day, I saw something rather strange that I was not very likely to forget. It was a kind of harmless dragon sprawling on a hill. ceaseless flow of wet carpets. In fact, he was just lazy, but I didn't quite realize it at first, and he took advantage of my timidity to recruit me. Days in and days 
brings out a conscientiously dried carpet. Once, as I was performing my duty, repeatedly and without my having done anything for it, the carpet fluttered in a queer way. Then, like ghosts. I was pondering upon this phenomenon when a wild burst of laughter behind my back made me turn round and, oh horror, there he was, my brother, Father D, whom I had thought I had done with, shamelessly blowing between my legs. Well, he said, Getting on in life? The gentleman dries carpets now. You'll see, you fool. You'll see what happens when I get started and how I am going to shake these idiots. In a second, the whole carpet hill was turned upside down. Panicked, not knowing what to do, I kept running after him, beseeching him to hold himself. But his wild temper was set loose. He was going to devastate the whole province. After all this travelling, my lungs had grown quite strong. But when I saw that by the thief, after a mighty well, was gathering darkness and pushing it towards an unfortunate village, I could think of nothing better than to fly into a passion. I went to encounter him, and I who thought I was but a poor devil, inflated my lungs to the point of bursting and blew with all my might in the opposite direction. Well, in spite of what I had expected, he deflated. The villagers clearly understood my intervention, and I was overwhelmed with their delightful thanks. The time for attachment had come for me. It always comes, sometimes when least expected. I found my homeland here, and now my sole concern is to look after the happiness of its inhabitants. I've taken on a helper. She warns me of any danger. In mild cases, I send her where required, and she takes the matter in hand. One day, 
She came in all haste to tell me that a bride was in danger. According to the custom, the bridegroom had carried off his sweetheart, but he was most likely going to be overtaken by her brothers and thus lose her forever. until they were out of the race. And the fugitives lived happily ever after and had very few children. Since then, I have turned mellow, sheer perfume and music. I have become Bar de Sabah, the lover's wind. When you see trees, Staring gently in a special way. Know that it is Bada Sabah passing by, urging flowers, bodies, and souls to come to life. 